Today in AP World Simplified, we're going to be talking about the classical religious responses of Taoism and Buddhism and how religions like these spread through trade throughout the classical era. We'll start first with Taoism in China. Taoism came as a response to the rigid social and ritualistic hierarchies and traditions of Confucianism at roughly the 4th and 3rd centuries BCE uh, by its founder Lao Tzu. Now, while Confucianism advocated a strong hierarchy with a centralized government that um, demanded obedience and respect uh, to those below it, as well as maintaining a benevolent sort of rulership above in the family and in the state, uh, Taoism believed a lot more in a more individualistic and much less systematic approach to life. That one should be in tune with uh, the Tao or the sort of randomness uh, and, the, and almost like the resonance of the universe uh, that was taking place. Now these unplanned rhythms of the universe had a lot to do with nature uh, and the flow and harmony of, of energies throughout the universe. And harnessing or attaching oneself to this Tao would allow one to um, not reach enlightenment like the Buddhists would, but allow one to live a life that was in harmony with the universe uh, and with others. Now Taoists didn't necessarily oppose Buddhists because Taoists believe in a balance between varying forces in the universe. So where you may see Confucianism as more of a uh, balancing or more of a force of order, the order of the Tao would be more the order of the of chaos and they believed in, in sort of a harmony of both. That belief in a balance between order and chaos is epitomized in the Tao symbol of the uh, yin and yang, uh, which indicate that one, in, in order to, to properly balance the world, one needs both, not all order or all chaos, uh, to have a functioning uh, society in life. Now, while Taoism would be opposed by later states in China, ranging from the Han Dynasty and their putting down of the Yellow Turban Rebellion, which was associated with the Taoist movement in the uh, late second century uh, CE, there would also be opposing of Taoists uh, as late as uh, Maoist China uh, early, early in this 20th century. So Taoism has a, a long history of feuding with the very Confucian ideals uh, of the Chinese and the Chinese government. Now while the Chinese government would remain predominantly Confucian with the Confucian examination systems coming along with the Tang Dynasty later in the post-classical era, uh, and maintaining itself throughout Chinese history, uh, Taoism would be responsible for heavily influencing uh, Chinese culture. Uh, certain things um, and beliefs in um, herbal medication, acupuncture, feng shui, um, ideas uh, and art uh, emphasizing poetry and nature, those are all sort of elements that are derived loosely uh, from Taoists and Taoist beliefs. Taoism is also influential in establishing Chinese alchemy, uh, Chinese astrology, and giving a good portion, millions in fact, of Chinese uh, a more of a sense of local community and harmony uh, on an individual level rather than this strict rigid structure and hierarchy of the uh, Confucian model. Now while Taoism or Taoism came as a response to the rigid hierarchies um, and rituals of Confucianism, so did Buddhism arise in India uh, as a response to the rigid caste system laid forward by the Vedic beliefs and Hinduism. Now Buddhism begins with the legend of the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, who was an, an Indian prince and an unknown time that was raised within his own castle or kingdom uh, and did not really realize the suffering of non-royal people. After venturing out of his palace, he noticed several people uh, suffering from either hunger, disease, or perhaps old age, and he realized that this system that was laid forth, uh, this system of accruing karma, uh, dying and being reborn into a world full of suffering was sort of an endless cycle of suffering. Now this endless cycle of suffering was known as dukkha. And again, the emphasis here was that no matter what you did during your life, even if you accrued good karma and went up within uh, jati or uh, varnas, you were still stuck in this perpetual cycle of being reborn and suffering in the world um, until ascending all the way to the top of the hierarchy and perhaps reuniting with Brahma. What was also hard to grasp for many people under the Hindu caste system was the inability of one to move oneself out of their current social position in that lifetime. That's going to make Buddhism, which is much more open to all genders and classes, uh, appealing to the lower castes, uh, which make up most of the people uh, of India and other places that would later uh, have the Hindu caste system implemented. Now to simplify, Buddhism of course is the idea that you want to get out of this endless cycle of karma, reincarnation, and, and suffering. So the goal here is to use strategies such as asceticism, which is where you deny yourself sort of the material wants of the world, which are what the Buddha saw as the cause of the suffering, wanting these sort of uh, immaterial or these material goods and desires that were not not permanent 
uh, things that would, even once attained, not bring us true happiness. Uh, so this life of asceticism was essentially denying ourselves these desires and these wants for material goods uh, that are not eternal. Aside from denying yourself these desires, one of the other goals of the Buddha was to achieve enlightenment, which one could attain through perhaps meditation, and that is the realization of one's past lives, the accruing of karma, and how to sort of transcend that uh, within a lifetime. Now this belief, again, was very appealing as it was open to all people uh, in the various uh, strata of society, including women, and that would allow people who wanted to join the movement uh, as a monk and, and you know, devote themselves to this ascetic lifestyle of meditation and pursuing enlightenment. Uh, it could be anybody, and that was quite appealing uh, to the majority of uh, people that were under the Hindu caste system. Now, under the Maurya Empire of Ashoka in the classical era, Buddhism would gain state sanctioning and would attempt to be spread through the building of stupas and monasteries uh, throughout India. However, the caste system in India was too firmly placed, uh, and Buddhism would have to migrate out of India to really take hold. Um, and as it moved out of India through trade routes, uh, such as the Indian Ocean Trade Network and the Silk Road, which we'll talk about later in this video, uh, it reached into East Asia, where it blended with, with local beliefs and syncretized into what is known as Mahayana Buddhism, and in Southeast Asia, what is known as Theravada Buddhism. Now, while Theravada Buddhism would stick more closely to the original transcripts of Buddha and this aesthetic lifestyle, Mahayana Buddhism would focus more on the deification of the Buddha. In fact, it would focus more on the conversion of lay people who could achieve this sort of enlightenment in one lifetime. Um, and achieving enlightenment would mean, in Mahayana Buddhism, one could stay on Earth to help other sentient beings achieve this enlightenment. Those were known as bodhisattvas. And again, that was more popular in East Asia, whereas the more ascetic-oriented Theravada Buddhism was more popular in Southeast Asia. Now, these classical religions, in particular Christianity and Buddhism, are able to spread very rapidly across new interregional trade networks. Predominantly under the influence of the Roman Empire, we have the Mediterranean Sea Trade Network taking place in North Africa, Europe, and uh, in West Asia. And that is, again, mostly controlled by the Romans, but the fact that the Romans bring this stability uh, and safety to the Mediterranean, it allows people, particularly Roman citizens, to travel throughout and trade with relative ease. The key to this exploding trade in the classical era is the fact that there are large empires, centralized empires, that exist that are able to sustain these trade routes. So they provide protection and safety for their citizens, which allows them to focus not on fending for their lives on a daily basis or fearing uh, invasion by local kingdoms, but allows them instead to focus on producing goods. Uh, and with those more goods, they're able to buy more goods, sell more goods, uh, and trade those goods across long distances. Some of the other noteworthy empires that exist in the classical era that facilitate this trade are going to be the empires in the Indian subcontinent, the Mauryan and Gupta Empire, as well as the uh, Qin, and most particularly the Han Dynasty uh, in China. In fact, the Han and Roman Empire are going to connect for the first time between Europeans and Asians on a trade network called the Silk Road. Now, the Silk Road isn't a particular road, uh, rather a set of, uh, or a network of roads or navigational um, possibilities that were mostly traversed by pastoralists in those Eurasian steppes. However, having a, a, a strong unified government, a uh, centralized empire at either end, uh, really increased the safety and amount of goods that could be traded between regions. Now, along with the Silk Road and Mediterranean Sea Trade Network, we also have a developing Indian Ocean Trade Network, uh, mostly taking place between uh, the empires of India, as well as the Empire of Persia and the coast of East Africa. Now these waters are not traditionally very safe for traveling. However, we'll have the development of two things, or rather the discovery of two things, uh, that is going to propel explorers and traders to more safely travel throughout the Indian Ocean trade now. Now sailors in the Indian Ocean are going to utilize and harness the power of the lateen sail, which is a triangular shaped set of sails that allow ships not just to sail with the direction of the wind, but it actually catches the wind uh, as it's coming in at a per perpendicular angle, uh, which allows ships to travel much more easily, uh, much more consistently, going every which way except for directly against the wind. Additionally, in the, in the Indian Ocean, we have, for six months roughly at a time, a series of consistent north and south winds, known as the monsoon winds, that would allow merchants to travel safely and consistently uh, north and south in varying segments of six months, uh, and, and thus ensuring a more consistent and safe set of travel uh, for these uh, traders in the Indian Ocean. Lastly, we also have the development of the Trans-Saharan Trade Network, which is uh, mostly the Bantu and Western uh, peoples of West Africa that form a rough trade link with the peoples of East Africa. Now, the Sahara Desert is still blocking them from North Africa and the Mediterranean Sea Trade Network. Uh, that, however, will change in the next era, the 
post-classical era, which will be our next topic in AP World Simplified. Don't forget, if you want access to all of my videos or other resources that would help AP students or teachers in AP World History, uh, please check out my website at morganapteaching.com. Thanks for watching.